Welcome back to this next edition of my Literary Salon podcast. I'm Damien Barr. Thank you for listening. A lot of the conversations I have in this podcast are challenging uh, to me and to my guest. This next one is more challenging, I think, than any other that I've had, and you might find it difficult too. This is a conversation with Rose McGowan, author, actor, activist, and above all, survivor. George Legato Chocolat said at the beginning of the evening about rise, and rising is the bravest thing we can do, she wrote in her memoir, and still she rises. It's humbling to consider the courage that she had to muster to face her own history, never help mind, never mind help mobilizing a movement around it. Rose McGowan was born into one cult, the children of God, and came of age in another cult, Hollywood. She has been a captive, a runaway, a starlet, a celebrity, a victim. And now she is an activist, an artist, a writer, and above all, a survivor. Her powerfully honest memoir manifesto is enraging, I have to say, um, and inspiring. She's helped spark a movement that continues to change our world. But what does it really take to be brave? Please welcome Rose McGowan. Thank you, Damien. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, cheery English. Hello. 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 How are you? Top. Chipper. 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 Um, I know you're going to read a couple of bits from us, and we, in a, in a change from plan, you're going to read something that I've not yet read of yours, which is a letter to your 16-year-old self? Um, a lovely man uh, named Joseph Galliano just came up to me, and... Uh, I remember being, you know, kind of every now and then people saying, can you contribute to a book to write a letter to your younger self? And um, this man, Joseph, just came up to me now with the book that I contributed to eight years ago and had no memory of. (laughs) So this will be new to you. This is new to me as well. (laughs) Let's see what I wrote to my 16-year-old self. Dear version 1.0, There you are, a spitfire in your uniform of black Doc Martin boots, black tights, black miniskirt, white boys button-down shirt, and your Revlon love that red lipstick. You keep the world and people at bay with rapid-fire delivery of some very tart words. In your mind, avoidance of closeness means avoidance of pain. You are right to be afraid of pain. In your future, there will be tremendous loss and some rough, rough sailing ahead. However, you are not right in thinking the pain will blow you away like so much dust. It will not. You are a fighter. You always have been. One of your curses is that people will see your exterior and assume you're tougher than you are. Everyone gets dealt some cards. That's yours. I wish you knew how much strength lies in simply saying that your feelings are hurt. Revealing your sensitivities is actually a very powerful thing. Along the way, you will meet artists and statesmen. You'll travel and work in far-flung places to do far-flung things. But then you've always known that. Deep down, deep down. Keep listening to that inner voice. It will carry you. It carries you still. The 16-year-old you was not optimistic for her future. The 16-year-old me, uh, not optimistic in the way that society would construct what an ideal future would be. Mm. I always knew it was going to be very big if I could survive myself and the world, which is, I think, all of our jobs, right? Surviving ourselves, foremost. Um, I knew it was going to be really big. I knew when I was six, I was going to be famous. I didn't know what that was. I'd never seen a TV screen or a movie. Um, But I knew there was something big and that it wasn't going to be the big deal. 
that I was going to figure out how to do something. When I first came to America, I kept seeing a bumper sticker, and the bumper sticker said, subvert the dominant paradigm. I read it like, subvert the dominant paradigm. <laughs> paradigm, 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 paradigm. Subvert the dominant paradigm. Oh, I can do that. I don't know how, but I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that on my list. So I did. Okay. So that was you at 16. Let's go back to you um, in Italy, because you are Italian. You were born in a stone barn. Um, a blind midwife um, brought you into this world. I'm actually English and Irish, but born in Italy. Okay, do, which passports do you have? I have an American passport. Oh. Bad times. I'm single, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Are you single? No. No. <laughs> but to gentlemen, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can, I'm sure there are a number of people here who can get you out of the American passport um, by the end of the night, but you don't want a Brexit passport because that's not much fun either. And I'm trying to get an Irish one right now unless Scotland becomes independent, which might happen. So, you know, uh, I know, there's oh a lot us. there. Oh, um, so, but let's, let's go back to Italy because I find it extraordinary that, that, you know, the early part of this book, which is little talked about in all the interviews um, that you've done, um, it's kind of glossed over, but you were born into an actual full-blown cult. Yes. You know, this is not the Church of England where people say hello. Um, this is something called the Children of God. What is it? Children of God um, was a cult. My father, who was from America, but he was like first-generation Irish, and my mother was first-generation British, um, they were in America and decided they didn't want to live there anymore. So they decided to go with this whole idea of starting a, a, a utopia, if you will. I don't like this universe. Who says I have to obey your rules? Let me go try to create a new one. And so they went to Italy. Um, there was this group called Children of God that was forming in California, naturally. And it's like the world shakes out the crazies and they all land in California. It's just, a, I mean, me too. Um, so my father and mother went, and my father joined this uh, thing called Children of God, and it was in Italy, it was in Tuscany, and that's where I grew up. I grew up in beautiful Tuscan medieval homes um, with a group of about 200 other people that were all searching for a new kind of world and a new kind of universal law, and like many, because it was supported by... I'll be really honest, men at the top who seemed to have a need to be worshipped, it got subverted. And what was, seemed like a good plan, like so many of these things, runs asunder. But the thing is, is when you get out of said cult and everyone says, oh, it's so strange how you grew up. It's so strange how you lived. And, and I always think, no, it's strange how you do your life. Because I see the cult-like patterns in yours as well. Mm -hmm. Before you get out of the cart, though, you're in it. And I want to yeah. understand, what was the moment as a child that you understood that your childhood was very different to the childhoods um, of other children? Probably when I'd be performing on the streets with um, just a little banjo and singing Jesus songs, and I would see the other children dressed differently than how I was dressed. Um, how? They were in... They looked really clean, and they had pretty little outfits, and I, there were no mirrors, really, in how I was raised for the first formative years. Uh, we were raised as super minds. Um, and so, I don't know, I'd be wearing, I guess, looking back, probably like brown overalls or something. Uh, and it was, it was clean, it was nothing like that. It was just, there was a, a very apparent difference between us and them. And we called everybody who were not in the group uh, systemites, which is chilling, but also somewhat apt. Mm. So I've always, you know, I get judged a lot as if I've had the same kind of life or traditional existence as many people, but I, ha I really haven't. I really didn't grow up. I don't, I mean, I know the Church of England from Henry VIII. Mm. But in terms of practice, in terms of what that actually means, 
um, what having parents in a house and a going to school every day, I, what that means, I don't know. I mean, Henry VIII was the last time anybody did go to church in England. Oh, is that true? I thought you guys all went on Sundays. <laughs> no, no, no. You Some, don't go on Sundays? No, people, people go in order to get places in schools, um, which, is, <laughs> which is another kind of... That's another kind of cult That's altogether. Another, see what I mean? That's another exactly. kind of cult You're altogether. making my point for I me. I am, I am. But so, so those children that, that you would see, did you... Like, did you, want to be, did, did you want to be friends with them? Did you envy them? Did you look down on them? What did you feel about those children when you would, when you would see them? And what did they feel about you? Oh, I have no idea what they felt about well, me. Well, how did they behave towards you? Kind of how people behave for a lot of my life, which was just kind of like you're the oddball. We're keeping one big eye on you. Right. I would say. <laughs> um, how I felt about them... I wanted their ice cream, their gelato, or their candy. I remember feeling that very strongly, that they all seemed to have sweets, and I didn't. So it was, it was mercenary, you see. But that's really a serious point, because actually, you spent a lot of the time, when you were a child, feeling something that a lot of people don't feel, which, is, which I know, which is hunger. Hunger. You were hungry. Yes. Why? Well, I was hungry at different times for different reasons. When I was 13, I was a runaway, I was homeless, and hunger became a constant then. And when I was much younger in the cult, um, they would feed you rice and milk to fatten you up if people were coming by to view the situation so they could assess your thinness level to make sure you were healthy, things like that. Mm. Yeah, Could but be. then later I became, you know, God, doesn't this sound fun? Later when I was anorexic, <laughs> before Hollywood, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, hunger, was hunger. that's an interesting thing you've posed, uh, yeah. the hunger thing. that Because it goes all the way through your life. I had no it, idea until this moment. Thank you for just rocking my brain. <laughs> but it, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's there, you're... You, and just in terms of the food, you know, you you feel you're hungry. You want connection with people because they give you food on a very basic level. They, they, they you know, you would be fed if other people were coming to see you and not otherwise. And then when you get to Hollywood and when you or when you get to America, you're repulsed by American food. The yes. cheese is so orange to you, <laughs> yes. that, you, the, you that you can't touch it, you can't eat it, you can't, you kind of almost start starving yourself at that point. I was, I started, when I got sent to America, I was so freaked out by the food and the orange cheese, that they called American cheese. And I, and I remember, and I write in my book, and I remember thinking this back then, dear America, why is your cheese orange? Why is your cheese orange? Why is and your president the color of your cheese? Why <laughs> is your president a craft single? <laughs> it's, uh, but you, but you, you kind of, you, you, you stopped eating at that point because you were totally disengaged from the culture. No, I was just disgusted. At that yeah. point, I was just went on strike. Yeah. And then later on, um, I, I find it amazing that you were able to do, to do anything because you were, you were starving yourself and you were exercising constantly. Like, I mean, actually, not just going to the gym not twice like a week, which to me is day. exercising constantly. <laughs> You're actually going to the gym, like, from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. Which, and I would try to sleep with my legs in the diamond position so I could exercise even whilst, you know. Really? Not. Not now. Being conscious. Oh, my God. Which was completely sad. I think, honestly, so much of that kind of body dysmorphia, it really just comes from if you've, if you've dealt with some very abusive things in your background and then you, all of a sudden you're living on your own and you don't know what to do so you just kind of recreate these really regimented rules for yourself and they just manifest in strange ways. Um, to go back to the cult to understand how you left it, just very quickly, their god was a Christian god, right? It was supposedly the same god that was... Supposedly. But, yeah. but you say at one point in the their book... Their god advocated having multiple wives and sex with children. I mean, that's quite a Christian God in many ways. But, um, but um, no, I mean, I, you know, it's a, but it's a troubling VIII. truth. But, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, many wives. Um, but, you, but you see, at one point, you had a private God. And, I did. And, your, and your God was nothing to do with their God. So I want to know, who was your God, right? And do you still have a relationship with that God through everything that you've been through in your childhood and your adulthood? I go in and out with God. 
you know, my own personal God. When I was very, very young, like two and a half, three years old, I would get, it's in my book, this woman would come in and sit on the end of my mat at night and ask me if I had, um, if I had allowed God into my heart. And I would say, no, not today, try tomorrow. And as I reasoned, it wasn't because I didn't believe in their God, I didn't. But it was because I believed in my own God. To this day, I don't know. It's a very, like, like so many of us, it's a very complex relationship, you know. In a foxhole, if I was under fire, would I be praying to God? Probably. Mm. Does that mean anything? I don't know. What would Christopher Hitchens say about all this? Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's very, but I knew that I didn't believe in their God. Okay. And, 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 and to me, that's just the outside of the societal God. And that's something I've, I've held with me throughout my life, which is when people come to you and they try to make you a part of their illusion so you can make their illusion feel okay, I've never personally been able to say, yes, I believe in your illusion just to make you in the short term feel better. I have to believe in my, what I believe in. And it might be at odds with yours. And it might not, but... Just don't force your beliefs on me. Okay. Let's talk about how you get to America, because the the, the cult is increasingly controlling. Your father decides he wants to have another wife, and and you end up with how many siblings altogether? I'm one of eight. Yeah, you're one of eight. So, but the point at which your father decides that he's going to get you out of the cult is the point at which the cult decides that it's okay to have sex with children. Correct. Okay, so that's his line. You are then sent Which to... I found out about later. We didn't know about you didn't why know that we were the time. leaving. No. Okay. We knew things were... I mean, it's hard to discuss what's creepy or what's not right when many things are creepy and not right. You're like, what rises to the level in this situation when you have 100 children sleeping on mats, but I've never seen a bed, so how do I know the difference? Mm. You know, um... It's like what hits your meter of something that's ding, ding, ding. But there was something that I always saw when I was little and and would watch my father who would sit on this kind of rattan throne-like chair. And my father was like a cross between like maybe a brown-haired Robert Plant, Jack Nicholson, and, and Jesus Christ. You know, when I was little, I, I was, um, when I was 12, I went after him one day. Because I was always going after him. <laughs> and he, uh, I mean, people think it's, a lot of people will say it's so funny how you grow up. They, they laugh it off. So I laughed it off, right? But then I think about it, and I think my father was a leader. He was also a fine artist. He was an incredible artist. Oh, my God. But he, um, he had a need to be worshipped, and that was his Achilles heel. But luckily, at least with us, he drew the line at, like, Yes, your eight-year-old should be having sex with this 70-year-old man because that's what God would want. So you were shipped to America. And it's interesting hearing you say that then, just, oh, you didn't know what your father knew about why you were being sent away, which I think explains how you managed to hold your father in such high esteem through the rest of your life. Because you're at war with him, but you also love him. It's a Correct. really My father and I have a really intense... Yeah. And it, it hasn't been solved by his death. No. It's still the number one relationship, I would say, in my life. He's, he's, uh, he, was, he was a really... Hats off, Dan McGowan, you weirdo. He was a really unique character, right? I mean, he was somebody that women would literally be on their knees just going like this for. And I would be in the corner scowling, staring at him, thinking like, uh, you're just a man. You're just you. I wish they knew that they were... It's not that you're bad. It's just that they're as good, and they don't know it. They've just had that information kept from them, these women. And so I was, I was his Achilles heel when I was 11. I write about this in, in Brave. My birthday card from him was, Dear Rose, I've always admired your sense of justice. Happy birthday. <laughs> and I was like, you weirdo. Weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so when, when um, you were in America, it was indirectly your father who, who led to you 
you know, having some of your first bad, really bad contact um, with the police. Um, he called you a feminazi, I think, when you were 13, <laughs> which uh, was like, 11. you know, 11, 11, 11 <laughs> it's just a nice Feminazi. Thing. Yeah. What? No. No. And that was when you were 11. Yeah. Um, and you and ran, then 13. And you and ran, on. And, and on it went. But one of the things that struck me about, so you, so you ran away uh, to, to escape forcible um, institutionalization. You, yes. were, you were told you were a drug addict. You denied being a drug addict. And you escaped from the place that you were put. Um, one of the things I found most shocking and powerful about that whole situation, and there is a, a, a lot about that situation that is really fucked up, um, is that nobody came to look for you. Um, and, and that was one of the saddest things about it. You, were, you had run away and nobody came to find you. And did you want to be found? Damien, tonight is blowing my mind. It never <laughs> occurred to me to think about it, to, to be honest with you. Did I, you, though? I mean, no, did, did you want to be found by different people? No, that's never occurred to me, not even until this moment, until you just said that. It never occurred to me to think about whether, because I, they wouldn't. So they, they were just, you were I was, gone. So to clarify, I was, I had just turned 13 and I had done a hit of acid at the eighth grade dance. Fine. So what? It happens. Uh, when someone who has flunked some grades is next to you and says, hey, do you want to hallucinate? And you're like, okay. And so you do. And then you have a, a mean stepdad and I'm living with my mother at this point in a state called Oregon, which is in the Northwest. And um, anyway, so it did not go well that night with me and my acid trip and my mother um, and the eighth grade dance. And so the stepdad had me locked up in a hospital where I was supposed to spend a year for being a drug addict. And I kept saying, I'm not a drug addict. And they kept saying, you're in denial. And I just thought, that's so good. You're completely going to get my mother's $35,000. Yeah. Awesome. So I escaped uh, a couple times, and the second time the escape stuck, and that's what Damien is talking about, to give you a... It, okay, so like I was saying, it's like everybody else's life, right? Yeah, just exactly the same. <laughs> um, but but, 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 it, but you, when, once, you'd, once you'd escaped, you'd, you'd escaped not just the institution, but your parents. So what, hap what, what, what happened next for you? What, how long were you living like that? Uh, for almost about 10 months, 11 months, I was lucky. Within the first month, I was taken in by two amazing trans women mm -hmm. and a stripper named Tina. And got taken to Tina's apartment in a town called Portland, Oregon. And, uh, and proceeded to get dressed up like Charlie Chaplin and go dancing on gay nightclub stages and, and rule the nights. Yeah. So that's what I did for that year. The queer community was your sanctuary. The queer community was my sanctuary. These were my haven. These were my people. My first boyfriend had a long skirt and uh, long hair, and I had short hair, and, that's, and he wore more makeup than I did, and that's how that went. So you've just kind of got back to where you were via yes. circuitous means. Yes. Exactly. So film, the first film you saw was in Italy that awoke to you the idea of, of glamour, of an external Correct. world. And then when you were in, um, in, um, in the States, you, your first gig in film was as an extra. Um, you took the gig because you had to pay rent to your dad. Yeah. It wasn't about becoming no. a star. I never had any interest in acting, to be honest with you. And I, I do, I laud people, and, and, and I'm, I'm amazed and quite mystified by people that love acting. I'm really impressed by that. Um, I am not that person who has that in them. Um, I happen to be able to leave my body and have other people take over my being. So I became, but when I was an extra, it was, it was mercenary. Acting yeah. for me was always, being like famous was an accidental, weird addendum that came to my day job. Mm. So let's talk about acting as absence, because I'm, I'm really interested in that idea. Because I think you spend a lot of your time in, this, in Brave, um, and it's interesting because I, I, I recognised it in, in Tracy's book, and actually to an extent in Adam's book, being told to be quiet, not have a voice, not yes. speak up, not be... You know, so you, you, know, you were literally at one point in your life forced by your stepfather to be silent for a month. 
right? Yes. So you have all that, and then you go, you're, you're, you're discovered, we can talk about that in a minute, um, and then you're given this opportunity to have a voice. And what, what is the voice that comes? Because it doesn't seem to me to be, doesn't seem to me to be, at that point, your voice. You the voice lost. that comes out, you mean? Yeah, yeah when, you're, when you're acting, it doesn't... Right now, you're not, you're not the person that you were. Like, it doesn't no. seem to me to be like you. When I looked at the picture of you on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, That's that was like a genetically modified animal. And Correct. in pain. That's what that looked like to me. It did not look like the person that I'm sitting with now. So, you know, what I want to understand is, 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 is an actor at that point, what, what did acting offer you, you know? Acting... Why it, did you do it? It, it, um... I was discovered two weeks after my boyfriend was murdered. And I was homeless again. And I was 19. And I didn't want to be homeless. And this woman, that was just the side thought, and this woman came up to me and, and while I was crying on the side of a street in Hollywood, and asked me if I was an actress and if I wanted to be famous. And I said, no. And then my friend that was with me was like, are you stupid? Do you know how much money that'll be? And then I thought, oh, I can get an apartment. I can get a flat. And eventually I wound up doing this movie. And so no, for me, it was never about... Which movie was that? It was called Doom Generation. Mm. And... Um, it won Sundance, it was did all these crazy things, and um, I had no knowledge of how the movie industry or any of those people worked or how they were. I didn't know anything about Hollywood other than classic film, which I'd seen a lot with my father later on, but not out of any modern... I didn't know who the wolves were. But you did know, and you said this earlier, that you wanted to be famous, or that you were going to be no, famous. No, no, I didn't want to be. Be, I said I going knew to I was, be. But I knew I was going to be famous, but I didn't understand what that meant. Okay. And I didn't understand how amorphous that is. Okay. But at one point, you know, when I was 10, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, had this satellite dish on her property that was, like, giant. And I would take naps in the satellite dish. And um, <laughs> it's the only place they got sun in the afternoon. And then cut to... 20 years later, and I'm a pixel that's beamed up into a satellite and then beamed back down and reconstituted in people's small square boxes in their houses all over the world. Mm. It's really meta, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and I did, it, I did it because I knew I was at some point going to reach this point of my life where I was going to work really, really hard to subvert the dominant paradigm. Mm -hmm. The bumper sticker. The bumper sticker, and I was going to take over the airwaves. Not in a way that meant you had to listen to me all the time. That's not what I mean. But in a way that was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be part of their system, and I'm going to sell them what their system is to them mm. through these controlled thoughts and actions of a whole machine behind me. I'm going to try really hard to connect with a certain sect of this audience, which I did all over the world, deep like fan base, that like kind of I would literally try to talk to people through the TV set, like, and it's no different than when I was little and they would take us to perform at sick and dying children's hospitals, mm. you know, uh, in the cult. And, and I would try to stare at the little children that were dying in the hospital beds like, I'm so sorry, I'm here singing Jesus songs. But you weren't there for so much of that. I think what's really interesting is that you say in the diaries at one point, you, re you conjured these alternative existences or alternative stories for where you were and what you were doing right. at the time so like i, I took a I, long absence yeah but you were myself. there but you were there on 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 screen but but not but there, not me but not there at all no so what where, where was the real you at that time um when i was nine i got a book on astral projection right and i started just practicing the discipline of that but that sounds bonkers does it? It does. It sounds totally bonkers. I, I, I want to... You've heard some of my life. Does that sound bonkers to you? <laughs> Actually, it sounds completely realistic. No. But, uh, no, it, but, 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 all like, that meant to me was that you can, you can be semi-awake and leave your body and go travel around to wherever you want to go. But isn't that just dissociation from trauma? Of course it is. Right. Okay, and but why the, not make it pretty? Why not make it pretty? Okay. Why not make it Hollywood? I no, understand. not Hollywood. Not why Hollywood. not make it art? Okay. Okay. So, Hollywood... 
becomes the destination for the person who starts out making art, who wants to make independent films, who wants to be something yes. different. And you find yourself gradually pulled into that. How does quickly. that... Quickly. Well, yes, actually very quickly in your case. How does, that, how, does that, how does that happen and how does it feel? And do you have time to react as it's, as it's going? I think it, it happens. I was, uh, I was an extraordinarily beautiful young woman. I think that's how that happens. And I think I also had a very surly look and was very sad looking at that time. And maybe that's an undeniable combination to people that look for the certain it factor. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Okay. There is a certain it factor that comes with all of this. There's a certain thing of like, that people don't really talk about. Um, some people are just really, they have a third eye and can dance with the camera. Some people can hold attention. I'm the daughter of a cult leader. What, what was I supposed to be? Yeah. yeah, you learned that very, very early. We performed at an early age for people so they believed what we were. Okay. So shape-shifting or disassociation from trauma or acting, like, it's both the, the best and worst job for that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does, it does seem to be both the best and the worst for you at yeah. different points. Yeah. Um, I, was, I kept thinking when I was reading the memoir, I wondered if there were moments where it could have been the best for you. I was trying to work out what that would have been for you. I, I don't know. I've tried to I work that out too, Adam. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've tried to work that out too. And so I was talking to my friend Adam about it the other night, and I was saying to him, there are so many people that my life... I think, at least parts of it, they would have really enjoyed. Mm. But I don't know how to be those people um, that wouldn't have enjoyed what for me felt like hot needles on my skin. You know, going to premiere was a nightmare. That was just like full horror show. Describe that. You're going down a red carpet the length of this room and there's a hundred men on either side, a couple women, and they're all screaming at you. I don't know if they do that as much in Europe, but in America they scream on the red carpet, Raaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
Um, I had to Google the NIC address. That's, that's not something you want to Google. Um, Why not? Then there's a lot that you find. Actually, there's a lot of little that you find um, with the NIC address. But, but I was really interested in you seeing, be more specific. seeing the picture of you in the NIC address and then reading how you felt about the NIC address was so interesting because it's this difference between being sexy and being yes. sexualized. So I wonder if you can just describe, actually, first of all, your journey to the premiere in the naked dress, because that's just was un, um, what women deal with, I just... Or women in this specifically in weird the, world. Yeah, but I mean, earlier tonight yeah. I was getting dressed and I was like, this bow tie is really tight. Um, and the producer for the event, Kirsty turned around and she said, yeah, walk in heels like that to yeah, me. And I was right? like, okay, exactly. fair enough. Fair I enough, it's not that, it, it's, was, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, I always but, wondered to men, I'm like, do you understand? We have a string that goes up our bottom, wires under our breasts, and things that we tilt forward on, and tight, clutching tight things all over, and we're supposed to be in a good mood ever? What? Do you even understand how hard that is? Do you, I mean, do you understand? But when, you, when you wore the naked, the naked dress, um, which has been much imitated and much copied, yes. to, get, to go to the premiere in that, you were in the car kneeling. Were you kneeling down? I was kneeling. kneeling. I was, okay, so... <clears throat> It was about four or five months after I was sexually assaulted, and I had to make my first public appearance. And it was at the MTV Music Awards, which at the time was like the biggest thing, you know. And uh, speaking of red carpets, extremely long. And I was a bit like Russell Crowe in Gladiator, but I, it was like, are you not entertained? Mm. So I thought, you want me to go down your red carpet? I'll go down your red carpet and subvert the dominant paradigm. So I wore a, wet, a dress that was all beaded and, and consisted almost of nothing. And it was literally, I didn't do it sexualized or to be sexy. I walked down that, like, literally, like as you guys would do, just like that. And of course, it's been imitated and taken yeah. as this sexualized thing in the world, you know, the shaming, the slut shaming it got after that, you know, worldwide, globally. And I was like, God, these people really don't understand what uh, that, that subtext was, is, do they? That was in LA. That was uh, in New York. In, oh, New York. No, it was LA, it was LA. Right. In New York, LA. it would be really... It would be really cold. Really cold. You're really yeah. right. It was not that, it was, it was definitely LA. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can only subvert the paradigm of the West Coast in nice weather. <laughs> I told you the crazies drop out there. Which was oh, the yeah. crazies? Oh yeah, the crazies. It's true, they're there. Um, listen, I know that we could quite clearly oh, talk sorry, all night. So no, 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 no. I'm going to take questions. So we're going to bring the lights up um, for questions. Um, um, and my, I have a question here on a, one of our question cards, um, and it is: Would you like to see uh, the Me Too movement reverberate deeper among the LGBT community and specifically among gay men? That's from Gay Star News. That's a very interesting question. Does that, do you think that means they want to see it come out in their own community more? Um, I mean, or... I think it could mean a number of things. I think it could mean that. I think it could mean men speaking out about their experience. I think it could mean I think men about men supporting should. the gay men expo supporting the experience of women. I don't. I'm not. Sure. That's the thing. I'm not really sure with this question. Which do you th do you think that gay men have done enough? to support the Me Too movement? Or I mean, I'd say gay men, because that's such a, like, there's a lot of them here. Hi. Um, Hi. But, um, but um, we'll talk later. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 you know, I think it's a cultural, a kind of broad strokes question. Because, I mean, I feel like there are a lot of similarities. You know, I, I've met this last year. It's been the most humbling and amazing experience meeting so many men and boys and trans women and trans men and, and everybody under the sun, women and girls, talking about their Me Too movement, or their own movement, which is, you know, if any of them have ever said anything out loud, then they're as equal to an activist as me, mm. right? So I've been humbled to hear so many more experiences from, from a lot, a lot of boys in the gay community. A lot, a lot, a lot of men in the gay community. I've been really humbled and honored that they've shared their story with me. And it's more than the media will ever cover. Mm. 
So I wish I could take a chip out of my head and, and show you guys that there is, there is so much beautiful support, actually. And it's support for themselves, too. It's support because so many of us get hurt. And then we turn around and we hurt or we become silently complicit in other people hurting. And that's just, you know, I think society is really only as sick as its secrets. It's not that I want to see gay men do more. I want to see humans do more mm. I, for all of us because our lives are at stake. Um, Tracy's speaking out yet, and Adam was talking about the experience of touring in terms of having PTSD and, and sharing his trauma and it being a healing experience. You have had, you know, a really tough ride with this book. Um, you know, you've been abused and you've been assaulted, but you've also had all these people contacting you and sharing their experiences. Um, how do you cope with that? Just as on a human level, just as a person, right. like, how do you cope with it's a lot. hearing all that trauma all the time? It was, I'll be honest with you, it was really hard, Damien, um, for... Personally, it's so triggering, mm. you know, and, and if I'm, but at the same time, I'm super honored and proud. And I'm, I am, I oftentimes, this is the first person these people have said this to. Mm. Mm. It's a lot to shoulder. There's a saying that they said in the cult, God doesn't give you more than you can carry. I guess I can just carry a fuck ton. And you are. But I think all of us can carry more of a fuck ton. Hey. hey. <laughs> Share the love. Okay, um, let me see some hands up out there. Um, okay, one here, Nikki, and then one there at the front. Thanks. Go. If she was like Tracy, she'd be out trying to buy belts and just fail it. <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting question. What would your 16-year-old self want to say to you? No, not the other way around. She's talking to you. What do you think she wants to say? That's a beautiful question. Well done, you. <laughs> you lived. Question here, Patrick. It's a really good question. What have you gained in the best way, just almost exactly a year ago yes. from, from it all happening? What I have gained in the best way, um, speaking to you, getting to finally get to have a conversation with people, because for how I was personally marketed and sold for so long, and how if the world perceives you as a celebrity, even though you're not, um, nobody's having a conversation with you. They're having a conversation with an idea. So getting to speak to you right now at this moment, this is the best thing. Please join me in thanking Rose McGowan. The reverberations from Rosie's memoir are still being felt and I know I'm going to be thinking about that conversation for years, possibly forever. If you want to find out more about the salon, find podcasts, pictures, tickets or how to win prizes from us, you can check our website www.theliterarysalon.co.uk. Thank you.